for two minutes until assembly for reveille formation. The uniform is gray trousers under gray jacket. This is the last minute to be called for this formation. Do not forget your lights. Two minutes, sir. Hey, mister, is your jacket supposed to be zipped up? Yes, sir. And get it that way. This piece of America has known but one traitor. His name was Benedict Arnold. His name is never mentioned here. This stretch of land is part of the 16,000 acres that make up the United States Military Academy at West Point, New York. It began to play a vital role in our nation's history in 1777. It was General George Washington who saw its strategic value to the lower Hudson Valley. He called for the Continental Army to build fortifications here. He directed that a massive iron chain be stretched across the Hudson River to prevent British ships from using its entire length. The strategy worked. It was an invaluable contribution to our battle for independence. At the suggestion of President Washington, Congress decreed that the United States Military Academy be built here in 1802, preserving this land forever as an American landmark. Since that first year when just two cadets were graduated, some 26,000 young men from all backgrounds have taken their places in the long gray line. It has been their destiny to serve America in peace and in war. They've had names like Grant, Lee, Pershing, MacArthur, Eisenhower, Bradley, Westmoreland. When they were not bearing arms, they were helping to build this nation. Men like George Gothels, the builder of the Panama Canal, and those whose engineering genius opened the gateway to the American West. These young men, all united by a deep and treasured devotion to duty, honor, country. The quarters of the superintendent of the military academy were built in 1820. The man who lives there now is Major General Donald V. Bennett, West Point, class of 1940. One morning each week, he eats breakfast with the Corps of Cadets. Good morning. Yeah. Our purpose here at the United States Military Academy is to prepare qualified, motivated young men for service to their country as professional officers in the United States Army. This has been our purpose since 1802. It is unique in that it differs from any civilian college or university and requires a great deal of involvement and dedication from every one of us. The three phases of our training program, the academic, military, and physical, are designed to develop dedicated military leaders of intellectual ability and strong moral character. While the increasing complexity of the world places changing demands upon the military profession and on the institutions which prepare our leaders, some things do not change. So even as we try to expand and to adjust our curriculum to keep pace with the times, we continue to place constant emphasis on duty, honor, country a hallmark of West Point that has been with the Military Academy and its graduates since its founding. General Bennett is the 47th superintendent of West Point. He has served in two wars. Yes, this morning, he breakfasts at a table commanded by first classman Bowden Neswicheni of Somerville, New Jersey. Cadet Neswicheni is ranked academically in the upper seventh of his class. He is a cadet leader, and he's captain of the Army football team. You don't have any problem with the academic department, do you? No, sir. Everybody's kind of looking forward to the Virginia game at the start of the year. I remember last year, the first game, about a week before the first game, you were all ready for it and could hardly wait at that time, if you remember. The so this year, it's three weeks away. Last year was only two. So this year makes it that much longer. I see. That's a long time after all the spring practice. Attention doors. A sum of money in a black folder was found in Grand Hall this weekend. Owner may claim same at the brigade staff table. <coughs> Rest. A cadet's day starts at 10 minutes to 6. 
Between 5.50 and 7.40, he has breakfast, shapes his room into order, and if he wants, he studies. Then he's off to class. If he's a plebe, he'll get there faster than the others do. At West Point, a plebe is a freshman, a fourth classman. There isn't anything lower. His academic schedule, like those of his fellow cadets, runs from Monday through midday Saturday. As a plebe, he will take courses in English composition, engineering fundamentals, a foreign language, and the backbreaker of them all, mathematics. The, the difference between the two, the indicator function and the lower indicator function, will be less than my epsilon. Gentlemen, are there any questions? In his plebe year, he will spend 260 hours in his personal duel with the inbred pitfalls of math. Approximately 3% of his classmates won't make it. Uh, let's go to the analytical proof of 9-10. Mr. Lampley, would you give us that, please? It has to have the same relationship between the dependent and the independent variable as a function has. Okay, and how do we multiply those two together, Mr. McCabe? Sir, you multiply each respective scalar component and then add them up. Okay. What's the... Uh, Geometrical interpretation of the... If he manages to survive this first year, he can tangle with differential equations, probability theory, and statistical inference in his second or yearling year. Colonel John Sumner Dick heads up the Department of Mathematics. He explains West Point's philosophy on math. Mathematics is fundamental in the education of all cadets. It performs two distinct roles, the first being as queen of the sciences. Every cadet must master calculus in order to understand physical science and engineering in his later courses and in his graduate studies. He must be ready as an officer to grasp the applications of probability and statistics to gunnery, bombardment, supply control, and military intelligence, as well as understand the mathematical foundations of long-range missiles and satellite orbits. These are the technical objectives of mathematics in the education of cadets. But beyond these are the even more important liberal objectives of developing qualities of intellect and character required in military leadership. Here, the teaching method develops the cadet in ability to see the central issue of any problem, to reason logically and swiftly to a conclusion, and to express his plan in precise language. And ask, what were my conclusions regarding H sub zero? Using this value and this statistic, I found that it was... That As a yearling, a West Pointer spends 139 hours in math classes like this one, under the guidance of Major George Richardson. I still did not commit a type 1 error. Mr. Copeland, what is a type 1 error? Sir, a type 1 error is the rejection of a true hypothesis. The rejection of a true hypothesis, right. Well, now, let's suppose that we just change that uh, last problem there, mu equal 26, and, and make it uh, mu equal 30. Now then, has he made a type 1 error, Mr. Baldwin? Well, sir, as Mr. Copeland just said, in order to commit a type 1 error, you must reject a true hypothesis. And in this case, the hypothesis is true, but Mr. Copeland did not reject it. Therefore, it would not have been possible for him to commit this type 1 error. Right. Is that clear? Another plebe course is called Earth, Space, and Graphic Sciences. Here, a plebe gets the fundamentals of engineering on the draftsman's board. This is one of the oldest academic departments at West Point. In its early stages, its students produced several now priceless pieces of art such as the head of a Roman soldier by Cadet Jefferson Davis, who later was the president of the Confederacy. A Western Indian scene by Cadet Ulysses S. Grant. The Gladiators by Cadet William Tecumseh Sherman. And these Ladies with a Letter by Cadet James Whistler, who often lamented that if he'd been correct when he guessed that silicone is a gas, he would have been a general instead of an artist and poet. Cullum Hall is a sacred cow at West Point. It is a treasury of memorabilia from the 19th century, focusing mainly on the Civil War period. It is here that a harried plebe tries to get away from the system, a place where he can relax with his fellow sufferers, eat a hamburger, have a soft drink, be with his favorite girl. In an atmosphere heavy with military tradition and heritage, he can try to forget the pressures.
gentlemen, today's class is concerned... At West Point, the classroom is only a part of the academic structure. The academy uses two separate teaching branches in preparing her cadets for careers as professional army officers. The cadets' intellectual growth is the responsibility of the academic department. This instruction is confined to the classroom and the laboratory. His moral and physical development is entrusted to the tactical department, which uses both indoor and outdoor instruction to achieve its purpose. The two philosophies, while following different guidelines, unite in preserving West Point's whole man concept of education, meaning keen mind, strong body. The academy also relies on the tactical department to instill in a cadet military bearing and discipline. Each cadet company, and there are 32 with a strength of 97 cadets each, has a tactical officer. He's the cadet's big brother, companion, and superior officer. One of his tasks is room inspection. He makes these regularly, always with a cadet officer in his company. Room, attention, hot. Morning. Morning, sir. How are you men today? Fine, sir. How are your studies going, Mr. Clouseau? Pretty well, sir. How do you stand in math now? Sir, it's improving. Very fine. You dragging this weekend? Yes, sir. As the TAC makes his inspection, the cadet officer will note down any irregularities. These can range from unauthorized items in a room to undusted furniture, water spots on a mirror, or unshined shoes. Good looking pair of shoes, Mr. Catani. Thank you, sir. Name tags coming loose off this bed, Mr. Clouseau. Yes, sir. Each deviation from form is noted and goes on the record of the offender. This is called a demerit. Plebes are allowed 20 demerits a month. Upperclassmen are allowed 13. General comment, Mr. Cerny, you might check on the serviceability of these cadet slippers. Yes, sir. Good morning. Good morning, Good morning sir. sir. Sign your frogs for you, Commander? Yes, sir. Is that right? Yes, sir. You could do a better job shining your frogs, too. Yes, sir. For every demerit that exceeds the monthly limit, a cadet is punished. This can be confinement to quarters at specified times or penalty tours. This is known as walking the area. Sometimes the area is more heavily traveled than flirtation walk, West Point's Lover's Lane. Of course, it's not nearly as popular. This is where the game of 20 questions has become extremely popular. The cadet often passes the time while on penalty tour by firing questions and answers alternately at his neighboring walker as they pass. Is it animal? <laughs> it has to be done, though, through clenched teeth, since talking during area formation is strictly prohibited. The demerit system is in no way tied to the highly prized honor code at West Point. Violation of the honor code leads to the immediate discharge from the Corps of Cadets. The honor system was initiated and is enforced by the Corps. It means that a cadet will not lie, cheat, or steal. While the tactical department exerts its pressures on the cadets through military training and athletic competition, the academic branch at the academy supplies the alternate current of pressure. This is done through classes like electrical science. The electrons are streaming out of the cathode into the plate. Once they hit the plate, they have some have a tendency to bounce off because they're, they're ramming in. Captain John Bertie, West Point, class of 1960, with a graduate degree from the University of Michigan. Even though a cadet's academic schedule ends by 3.15 each day, his activities do not cease. He then participates in either intramural athletics or corps squad competition on the intercollegiate level. Athletic competition is taken seriously at West Point. Here, it is played for keeps. Maintaining winning records in 18 intercollegiate sports with West Point's modest enrollment is extremely difficult. Yet in 1966, West Point posted winning seasons in every sport.
The academy finds it difficult to attract many high caliber athletes because of the rigors of cadet life and because of the fact that each cadet must spend five years in the army after graduation, which means passing up the huge bonuses being offered outstanding collegiate athletes today by professional sports. At West Point, the cadet must first be a scholar and then an athlete. He is granted no concessions, no special privileges. Desire and dedication are the keys to sports at the academy. All too often, army teams must make up in spirit and in drive what they lack in natural talent. The philosophy on sports at West Point is best summed up by two men. Colonel Jerry Kapka, director of athletics, reasons that winning is all important because second best is never good enough on the battlefield. General of the Army Douglas MacArthur said it another way in reflecting on the importance of athletic competition. His words were these, upon the fields of friendly strife are sown the seeds that upon other fields, on other days, will bear the fruits of victory. Precisely 11.50 each morning, classes come to a halt. The cadets then have 25 minutes to prepare for the noon lunch formation. As with most things at West Point, this is carried out with an eye to tradition. The cadet's schedule is worked out with infinite exactness, so that almost every minute of his day shows some degree of productivity. When he's not eating or sleeping, he's like a piece of elastic being stretched several ways at once. The theory here is that the cadet learns that he can take a lot more than he thought he could. There's now a move toward easing up on the cadet's schedule. As one tactical officer put it, we have to give the cadet some additional free time, even if he uses it only to contemplate his navel. Cadet Neswicheni has endured this pace for more than three years now. Whenever somebody asks me about West Point, I say it's a nice place to visit. It wasn't made to like. Sure, you have a daily routine, but if you expect to stay and make it through, you have to get used to it. People often ask me, would I do it all over again? And it's hard to say, but I know one thing, I wouldn't give it up right now for anything in the world because of what I've gotten out of it. While West Point continues to observe the many time-honored traditions of the military, its academic program has surged ahead to keep pace with modern times. West Point places emphasis on modern technology. It has to. The cadet takes two years of physics with the greatest stress on nuclear physics. With the science end of his curriculum so designed that one course blends into another, the cadet has to know his stuff. A slip-up somewhere along the line during one year is sure to haunt him in another subject another year. Nuclear physics includes the study of radius, binding energy, angular momentum, magnetic moment, 
in something called quantum mechanical treatment of alpha decay and the deuteron. Normally, a cadet class numbers between 10 and 14. In some, it is less, and in a few, it is slightly more. This system of small classes is carried through West Point since the days of Sylvanus Thayer in the early 1800. Sylvanus Thayer, who is regarded as the father of the academy, was one of its early superintendents. He was the innovator of countless educational techniques, many of which are still used today in universities all across the country. It was he who devised the sectioning of cadets. As the grades of a cadet fluctuate, the cadet is resectioned monthly with a group having similar grades. This is all made possible because of West Point's requirement that every cadet recite or participate in each class each day. Sir, well, when you say the Army was conservative. Uh, you may be justified in making the statement, but the thing is, the Army acts according to the needs of the times. And around 1920, 1930, there, there was no real great threat of a war. So the Army just went about slowly uh, developing uh, their airplanes and their tanks. And they were, in a way, they were ready for World War II when they came along and they met the challenge. Because of this arrangement, a cadet cannot slough off in class and hope to catch up by cramming for an exam. The system also serves as a warning never to show up in class unprepared. Almost every cadet is graded daily, and weekly his grades are posted in one of the four main sally ports at the academy. In this way, a cadet can keep a close check on where he is strong academically and where he needs to bone up. Looks like Oh, God, right up. Looks like it was a pretty good week. That's good. There you go. Where'd you go, buddy? 2-5. Hey, where'd you go? Well, at least I'm a pro. Bad day. Look at him. Look at Fireschmidt. He went 2-5-2. If he keeps that up, he's not going to be the last man. That makes me feel a little bit better anyway. Yeah. No weekend privileges. Yeah, we'll miss you down there at Snuffy's Day. What section is that? The last. What else? You'll have a good time at West Point, Dave. You got the joke problem? No. Two-thirds of each graduating class will at some time or other pursue graduate study in a civilian university. Many of those obtain master's and doctorate degrees and then return to West Point as instructors. Major John Wood Mansey is one of them. A highly decorated veteran of combat in Vietnam, he teaches military arts and sciences. As part of the curriculum, he and the cadets often get on the subject of Vietnam and the possibilities for peace. Let me attack it from this way and see if I can get some discussion going. I just don't have any faith whatsoever in the North Vietnamese or the communists at all. But I, <laughs> as far as it goes, you sound bitter. But uh, it would seem to me, what you're saying is we just give up the initiative completely. No. Uh, well, this is what it sounds like to me. Well, it may, it, okay. Just, uh, How do you envision that we're going to win the war? Sir, we have got to put the pressure on them. Victory, I think, has changed from what MacArthur said it was and the way the wars are being fought. But it doesn't mean that we sit back and just, uh, you know, just sit there, well, here we are, we'll just turn the other cheek and you can beat the living daylights out of us until you get tired, and then you'll go home. So you don't think, even if it, even if it were necessary to win the war, in quotes, by election of 68, you don't think they could do it? You can't rush things like this, sir. I mean, this is, this is too important to, to push yourself and try and get it done by a certain deadline. And there's too many, there's too many uh, lives and ideals that we have to stand for involved in this whole thing. Do you think we can win the major military part of it by 68? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I don't, well, military, it's dying down now, sir. I think the major part... Don't tell the Marines up north. Oh, no, sir. <laughs> but, I mean, they're not, they're not coming out in force like they used to, sir. We, they know they can't face our firepower, but what they're trying to do is undermine the government still, sir. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's the major thing we've got to defeat. We've got to show the people that there is something else besides communism to turn to something that can save them and, and improve their standard of living. I think that's what we're doing now, sir, but it's going to take time. Because of their broad academic background, West Pointers can get their advanced degrees without too much difficulty. A few even go into law. The Academy has a course in military justice and international law. Prosecution calls as a witness Sergeant Luce Bolt. Sergeant Luce Bolt and Lotta Miles, favorite characters at cadet trials. Sergeant Luce Bolt reports the President of Court is ordered. Raise your right hand. Sergeant Luce Bolt, do you swear that the evidence you shall give in the case now and herein shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? I do. State your full name, grade, organization, armed force, occupation, or residence. Sergeant Luce Bolt, 40, 443rd Latrine Digging Company, 
West Point, New York. Please be seated. Sergeant Bold, on the evening of 5 May 1966, did you see the victim, Miss Lotta Miles? Uh, yes, sir, I did. She was hysterical, crying, nothing, nothing spectacular that I noticed. I didn't, I didn't really know what to make of it. I wasn't sure what happened. Uh, you say she was crying, Sergeant Bolt. Uh, would you say that uh, she was in uh, a very grievous state of shock, that she was in what you might call hysteria? Uh, yes, I think you could say that. Objection. The, the uh, witness is not a medical uh, person and is not qualified to make such a judgment as whether she was in shock or not. This is up to a medical, medically qualified personnel. Statsmirna. Господин профессор, стоя на лицо. Хорошо, садитесь, пожалуйста. Здравствуйте. Как вы поживаете сегодня? Civilian instructor Nicholas Maltsov forbids the use of English in his Russian class. All cadets must take at least two years of foreign language. Some, like cadet Nezwicheni, take four years. Today, he and cadet Mike Kolakowski talk about a recent trip. Ну хорошо. Здравствуйте, Майк. Как вы сегодня поживаете? Здравствуйте, Богдан. Очень хорошо, спасибо. Я вас уже давно не видел. Да, я знаю. Я только что вернулся из путешествия. Ну, где вы были? Fluid mechanics is the study of the properties of liquids, vapors, and gases. It is vital in a cadet's education. Now, if we know a weight flow rate and we know the gamma of the fluid, what, what can we compute with so this? So you get the volumetric flow rate. Okay, now with the volumetric flow rate and the size of the pipe, this will let us compute what? So it'll give us the velocity of okay, the Okay, you can flow. get the velocity of flow through the pipe. Then using this, you can go ahead and compute the Reynolds number. Now, Nesvashini will ultimately want to convert this to a volumetric flow rate. 47.6, 4 4.4, 4.7, 3.1. Okay, next one. Once the experiment is completed, the cadets put the computers to work. West Point is not strictly a man's world. Mrs. Beatrice Holland plays a very vital role in cadet life. She is the official cadet hostess. It is she who lends assistance in polishing a cadet through instruction and in the social graces. Her office is where cadets can find a touch of home. Coffee and candy are always available. Mrs. Holland is also a prime contact with the feminine world on the outside with her noteworthy file on the thousands of young ladies who flock each year to West Point to date the cadets. The girls are so anxious to get up to West Point. They pay us very pretty compliments about our cadets and what wonderful dates they make. I get much mail every day from girls from all over the country. And there's a little girl who wrote and said that she was short and cute. And there was another girl who wanted a man who was tall, dark, and handsome. And another one who wanted to date a cadet, any cadet, she didn't really care. We have a bulletin board where we keep all sorts of current information and uh, we have a date list. And the cadets come in and scan this pretty thoroughly with a practiced eye. And then the young men themselves make their own date arrangements with the girl that they've chosen from the board. Mrs. Holland also assists in setting the guidelines for the cadets on how to be thoughtful hosts. During the course of four years at the point, a cadet may be singled out to host visiting dignitaries, sometimes even royalty, as well as his contemporaries from the other service academies. As an example, every two years, the Corps is host to the cadets from Canada's Royal Military College. A bandbox review is one of the weekend highlights.
course, Mrs. Holland's teachings also come in handy when a cadet is hosting that someone very special. It can be difficult for a cadet to get off alone with his girl. Privacy at West Point is almost non-existent, and free time can be very limited. A cadet has to learn that because he is a West Pointer, he will live a fishbowl existence. But sometimes a cadet can find some peace and quiet with his favorite girl at his side. Bud Neswicheni's girl is Tina Moore. She lives near his hometown. She too is a college student, and the distance she has to travel, as well as Bud's athletic commitments, make these moments rare. Buddy's sport commitments and travel make it difficult for us to be together as much as we would like to. But after a while, you get used to the fact that this is the way it must be. West Point is a very unique place. It's not at all like other campuses. If you're looking for wild fraternity parties, you won't find them here. But if you're looking for a real good time and to meet an awful lot of nice guys, you couldn't find a better place. Each year, the graduating class puts on a 100 nights play, signifying just 100 nights till graduation. The cadets use it as a vehicle to knock the system. The cadet author of this play envisioned that someday cadet class clubs would have bunnies as waitresses. He also saw Batman as something less than a hero. Look out! Look out! to stop this now. You go change first. I'll confront them. Right. Aha, Dr. Lee Duke. You're found out. In a minute, you'll be in trouble. Get ready. platoon is located in the town of Lepuling, and several squads are located on the hills about the town. Tactics is one of the classroom courses that is controlled by the tactical department. To seize the bridge at Lepuling intact. For the last 15 minutes, you have had the requirement to select objectives for this assault. At this time, I'd like Mr. Netrocheni to come forward and present his solution and be prepared to defend it. Gentlemen, we're having an air, air mobile operation and our assaulting units will be dropped on or near the objectives by helicopters. Our first objective... From theory to practice. This is action at Camp Buckner. For eight weeks each summer, the incoming yearling class, last year's plebes, get an intensive military training program. Buckner is part of the West Point Military Reservation. We're pulling against While there is no substitute for actual combat conditions, the training is made as realistic as possible for the cadets. Part of the cadets' training includes engineering techniques, particularly the construction of all sorts of bridges. This is often carried out under fire and with a time limit set for completion. The eight-week program is laid out by the tactical department, but the incoming first classmen directed on the company level. Fire! Run, hang on to. Running. Found hanging. Up. Hang around. Fire. 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 Fire
All right, come on, hurry, hurry. All right. During the eight weeks, the cadets will go through all sorts of training designed to prepare them as future military leaders. Now, get out of here, so I'll jump. Come on, move out quick now. Way to go. Way go, Pop. Way to go, baby. Bucket. Go, go, jump go, high. Go, go, go. Jump high. This is Rakondo, and this is where it happens, baby. It is the roughest of all the cadet training periods. In just one week, the cadets have crammed at them instruction and training that would normally be spread out over a period of six weeks. This is where the word ranger and Rakondo become bywords for the rest of a cadet's career. The rangers of the 101st Airborne Division, all of them combat veterans, direct the program. The early stages of training start in what is called the combat pit. During the second day, he's taken on a two-mile forced run up a mountain road. This is where the eight weeks of training begins to take its toll. If a cadet doesn't make it all the way through Rakondo, he has to keep repeating the entire week until he does. Sling rope that you now have. At the top of the mountain, the cadets are given instruction in knot tying. There are red-faced rocks all over the mountainside. They serve a purpose. Every time a cadet doesn't follow orders to the T, he's ordered to do push-ups with his feet on the red-faced rocks. Many cadets do several hundred before the week ends. What are you doing down there, point two? The knot tying instruction is a prelude to cliff repelling. With the rangers keeping up a steady stream of harassment, stretching the cadet far beyond the bounds of ordinary physical and mental endurance, the cadet goes straight down the side of a 75-foot cliff. Point two, you better get off my rope. to the red rock. Lord molasses in the wintertime. As the week progresses, the cadets get training in survival. At first, they are permitted the luxury of tents, but by the third night, they're on slim rations and forced to sleep out in the open. They average perhaps two hours sleep a night over the last three days. This all builds up to a seven-mile forced march on the last day of Rakonda. Awaiting them is the slide for life. Since he was a battalion commander, Bud Nezwicheni set the example for his troops by taking the slide himself. He didn't have to do that. Besides the slide, the cadets must cross a log arrangement some 30 to 40 feet above the water. Then they climb out onto ropes, try to execute three chin-ups with what strength they have left, and then salute, asking permission to drop into the water. Some can't wait for a reply. Once they hit the water, they know the ordeal is over, at least for most of them it is, unless some ranger wants to get in one last shot at the graduate Rakonda. The Army team is the pride and dream of every heart in gray. Here in the quiet beauty of the lower Hudson Valley live the Black Knights. They don't play just a sport. At West Point, they are part of tradition. Army football is steeped in things called pride, desire, spirit, a never-say-die attitude. To play Army football means to never give up never let up. To beat the Black Knights is a supreme accomplishment. There are few schools that play this game harder. There are few schools that feel defeat so deeply. With its picturesque setting and the glamour of Army football, Saturdays in the fall bring thousands of football worshippers to West Point. Before they start piling into the academy, coach Tom Cahill and team captain Bud Nezwicheni take the core squad for a traditional pre-game walk. 
Then while the Corps squad prepares for the game, the Corps of Cadets entertains the public with a traditional pre-game review on the hallowed plane. review ends, the Corps begins its chant. In this case, Beat Virginia. Then out come the picnic tables and the festivities get into full swing. This is called tailgating. As game time approaches, the carillon in the cadet chapel begins its serenade. The traditional hike up Mills Road, where at the very top, just around the bend of Lusk Reservoir, lies the home of the Black Knights, Mikey Stadium. Bud Neswicheni is the 78th captain of Army football. He was born in a displaced persons camp in Germany after the end of World War II. When his mother was told that he had been elected captain of the Corps squad, she wept. It was a dream come true for Bud. Ever since I started playing football, I think I was an Army football fan. My big ambition was to play football for Army. Among my teammates, we have a saying, the big thing to do is to make the all-Army team. And that means to become a starter. And that was my big goal in life, just to play ball for Army. And the day I started my first game, I thought it was the best thing that ever happened to me. The Corps is regarded as the Army team's 12th man. During the course of a game, they make their presence felt. There is a bittersweet nostalgia pervading West Point. It runs deep. West Pointers rarely speak of it. It is something very private. It is there because of the nature of West Point. Time changes few things at West Point. When a graduate comes back for a tour of duty, everything appears pretty much as it did when he wore cadet gray. Very often he brings a wife with him. And in many cases, West Point means as much to her as to him, because they began their life together when he was a cadet.
This is the land Charles Dickens called the fairest of the fair. It is the birthplace of many great Americans. It is the resting place for many more. For 165 years, this land has provided America with a long gray line. It has challenged many men to sum it all up. General Douglas MacArthur, in his final appearance before his beloved corps, did it best. Yours is the profession of arms, the will to win, the sure knowledge that in war there is no substitute for victory, that if you lose, the nation will be destroyed, that the very obsession of your public service must be duty, honor, country. The long gray line has never failed us. Were you to do so, a million ghosts in olive drab, in brown cocky, in blue and gray, would rise thundering those magic words, duty, honor, country. But always in our ears, ring the ominous words of Plato, that wisest of all philosophers. Only the dead have seen the end of war. Today marks my final roll call with you. But I want you to know that when I cross the river, my last Conscious thoughts will be of the core and the core and the core. This is the long gray line. In it are the wheat fields of Kansas, the coal mines of Pennsylvania, the granite hills of Vermont. It is where you will find the twinkle in the eye and the boyish grin that is America. This is the point. March along.